Aggression and the Environment. Mary Ruart, 2003. We are more likely to protect the environment when we own a piece of it and profit by nurturing it. In this chapter, we'll learn how third-layer aggression harms the environment and increases costs of many important services. With third-layer aggression, we are forced, at gunpoint if necessary, to subsidize the exclusive monopolies created by second-layer aggression even if we don't use them. Of course, we can be forced to subsidize service providers who do not have an exclusive monopoly. In real life, the layers of aggression that create the pyramid of power may change order from time to time. What doesn't change is that each additional layer of aggression decreases our choices and increases our costs. Encouraging Waste Whenever people do not pay the full cost of something they use, they have less incentive to conserve. For example, when people pay the same amount of taxes for solid waste disposal whether they recycle or not, fewer people are inclined to recycle. As a consequence, we have more waste and disposal problems. Conversely, when subsidies decrease, conservation automatically follows. In Seattle, during the first year that customers were charged by the volume of trash they generated, 67% chose to become involved in the local recycling program. Footnote, Lynn Scarlett, Managing America's Garbage, Alternatives and Solutions, Reason Foundation Policy Study 115, Santa Monica, California, Reason, September 1989. Because about 18% of our yearly trash consists of leaves, grass, and other yard products, composting coupled with recycling can dramatically lower a person's disposal bill. Footnote, Janet Marinelli, Composting from Backyards to Big Time, Garbage, July to August 1990, pages 44 to 51. As less waste is generated, fewer resources are needed to dispose of it. What could be more natural? Discouraging Conservation Water utilities are usually public monopolies subsidized by our tax dollars. In California's San Joaquin Valley, 4.5 million acres of once desert farmland is irrigated by subsidized water. Taxes are used to construct dams for irrigators, pay many of their delivery costs, and support zero-interest loans to farmers who pay only a tenth of what residential customers do. Footnote Randall R. Rucker and Price V. Fishback, The Federal Reclamation Program, An Analysis of Rent-Seeking Behavior, in Water Rights, edited by Terry L. Anderson, San Francisco, Pacific, 1983, pages 62 to 63. These subsidies encourage wasteful over-irrigation, resulting in soil erosion, salt buildup, and toxic levels of selenium in the runoff. Kesterson Wildlife Reservoir has been virtually destroyed by irrigation-induced selenium buildup, which now threatens San Francisco Bay as well. Footnote. Terry L. Anderson and Donald R. Leal, Free Market Environmentalism, A Property Rights Approach, San Francisco, Pacific, 1990, pages 55 to 56. As long as our tax dollars subsidize the irrigators, however, they have little financial incentive to install drip sprinkler systems or other conservation devices. As a result, less water is available for other uses, so prices increase for everyone else. Without subsidies, irrigators would be motivated to conserve, making more water available for domestic use. Destroying the Environment the above examples of third-layer aggression deal solely with exclusive monopolies, where service is provided by a public works department, subsidized in whole or in part by taxes. Subsidies also go to maintain the federal and state lands, which encompass over 40% of the U.S. landmass, including nearly all of Alaska and Nevada. Footnote, John Baden, Destroying the Environment, Government Mismanagement of Our Natural Resources. Dallas, Texas, National Center for Policy Analysis, 1986, pages 20 to 21. And footnote, Baden, page 38. Land ownership is not an exclusive government monopoly, but the sheer size of the government's holdings, and the subsidies necessary for maintaining them, allow us to treat them as a product of third-layer aggression. Rather than exclusive licensing, aggression through government takes the form of forcible prevention of homesteading. Lands in the United States were originally settled by homesteading, a time-honored way of creating wealth. 
individuals or groups find unused land and clear it for agriculture, fence it for grazing, make paths for hiking, build a home, and so on. To own the new wealth, farmland, ranch land, etc., that they have made, creators lay claim to the property on which it resides. When others settle nearby, they choose different property on which to stake their claim. Government holds land by forcibly preventing homesteading. Sometimes we condone this aggression to protect rangeland, forests, and parks from abuse and destruction. By using aggression as our means, however, we endanger the ends that we seek. Overgrazing the range. The incentives of the congressional representatives who oversee the U.S. Bureau of Land Management are very different from individual landowners. The following imaginary conversation between a congressman and some of his constituents illustrates the dilemma that our sincere lawmakers have. Mr. Congressman, we represent the ranchers in your district. Things are pretty tough for us right now, but you can help us. Let us graze cattle on all that vacant range land the government has in this area. We'll be properly grateful when it comes time to contribute to your campaign. As a token of our goodwill, we'll make a substantial donation just as soon as we come to an agreement. The congressman has twinges of conscience. He knows that the ranchers will overstock the government ranges, even though they carefully control the number of cattle on their own land. Since they can't be sure of having the same public range every year, however, they cannot profit by taking care of it. They cannot pass it on to their children. They profit most by letting their cattle eat every last blade of grass. When the congressman shares his concern with the ranchers, they respond with, Mr. Congressman, we will pay a small fee for renting the land. Renters don't take as good care of property as owners do, it's true, but the land is just sitting there helping no one. People who want to save the land for their children and grandchildren must not have the problems we do just keeping our next generation fed. If you don't help us, sir, you'll have trouble putting food on your table, too. We'll find someone to run against you who knows how to take care of the people he or she represents. We'll make sure that you're defeated. The congressman sighs and gives in. After all, the ranchers gain immensely if allowed to graze cattle on the land he controls. They have every incentive to make good their threats and their promises. The person they help elect might not even try to protect the environment. The congressman reasons that he should give a little on this issue so that he, not some yes-man, can remain in office. The congressman finds that his colleagues have constituents who want the government to build a dam on public land or harvest the national forests. He agrees to vote for these programs in return for their help in directing the Bureau of Land Management to rent the grazing land to his ranchers. Naturally, these changes set precedents for many of the resources controlled by the government, not just the ones in this congressman's district. Because of these skewed incentives, almost half of our public rangelands are rented out to ranchers for grazing cattle at one-fifth to one-tenth of the rate of private land. Footnote, Ronald M. Latimer, Chained to the Bottom, Bureaucracy versus Environment, edited by John Baden and Richard L. Stroop, Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan Press, 1981, page 156. By 1964, three million additional acres had been cleared with environmentally destructive practices, such as chaining, to create more rentable rangeland. Footnote, Baden, page 18. Because the ranchers and their representatives cannot profit by protecting the land, they have little incentive to do so. As early as 1925, studies demonstrated the inevitable result. On overgrazed public ranges, cattle were twice as likely to die and had half as many calves as animals raised on private lands. Footnote, Gary D. Leibcap, Locking Up the Range, San Francisco, Pacific, 1981, page 27. Are the ranchers and their representatives selfish others whom we should condemn for overgrazing the range? Not at all. Had ranchers been permitted to homestead these lands in the first place, the rangeland would now be receiving the better care characteristic of private grazing. Our willingness to use aggression to prevent homesteading has taken the profit out of caring for the environment. When this aggression is even partially removed, the environment greatly improves. For example, in 1934, Congress passed the Taylor Grazing Act to encourage ranchers to care for the public grazing land. By allowing 10-year transferable leases, ranchers had control of the land for a decade. Ranchers who improved the land were given the positive feedback of good grazing or a good price when selling their lease. 
In essence, the lease gave them partial ownership. As a result, almost half of the rangeland classified as poor was upgraded. Footnote, Libcap, page 46. However, in 1966, leases were reduced to only one year, giving ranchers little incentive to make improvements. After all, they could not be sure that they would be able to renew their lease. As a result, private investment in wells and fences in the early 1970s dropped to less than a third of their 1960s level. Footnote, Libcap, page 76. When vast tracts of public property are misused, the environment can suffer great damage. Overgrazing of public rangeland was permanently destructive in many cases, contributing to the formation of a dust bowl in the Midwestern states. Footnote, Murray and Rothbard, For a New Liberty, New York, Macmillan, 1973, page 264. Logging the Forests As subsidies increase, so does environmental destruction. Most of the trees in our national forests wouldn't be logged without subsidies because the cost of building the roads necessary to transport the timber exceeds the value of the lumber. Once again, however, the special interests found a way to use the aggression of taxes to their own advantage. Let's listen to an imaginary conversation between the timber companies and their congresswoman. Ms. Congresswoman, the Forest Service has money in its budget for hiking trails. Now, we're all for hiking. We just think we should get our fair share of the forest and our fair share of the subsidy. Some of that money for trails should be used to build logging roads. Consumers will benefit by increases in the supply of timber. We'd profit, too, and see that you got your fair share for your campaign chest. We'd pay some money for replanting, too, so the environmentalists will be happy. The congresswoman considers their offer. She knows that the loggers, like the ranchers, have little incentive to log sustainably on public lands. She also knows that if the hikers complain, she can ask Congress for a larger subsidy so that the Forest Service can build more trails. Some of that subsidy can be siphoned off to build more logging roads. More logging roads mean more campaign contributions. Since hikers don't make money off the forests, they won't help her out the way that loggers will. The congresswoman won't protect the forests by fighting the loggers. Special interests reap high profits with subsidies, so they'll spend large amounts of money to protect them. If the congresswoman doesn't agree to the timber company's demands, they'll put their considerable money and influence behind her opponent. The timber companies will be able to log the forests. The only question is which congressional representative will reap a share of the profits. The congresswoman sighs and agrees to fight for more logging subsidies. As a result of subsidies' adverse influence, the Forest Service uses taxpayer dollars to log the national forests. By 1985, almost 350,000 miles of logging roads had been constructed in the national forests, eight times more than the total mileage of the U.S. interstate highway system. Footnote, Peter Kirby and William Arthur, Our National Forests, Land in Peril. Washington, D.C., Wilderness Society, Sierra Club, 1985, page 4. Construction of roads requires stripping mountainous terrain of its vegetation, causing massive erosion. In the northern Rockies, trout and salmon streams are threatened by the resulting silt. Fragile ecosystems are disturbed. Footnote, Baden, page 10. The Forest Service typically receives 20 cents for every dollar spent on roads, lodging, and timber management. Footnote, Thomas Barlow, Gloria E. Helfand, Trent W. Orr, and Thomas B. Stoll, Jr., Giving Away the National Forests, New York, NRDC, 1980, Appendix 1. Even though the timber companies are charged for the cost of reforestation, 50% of these funds go for overhead. Footnote, Baden, page 14. Between 1991 and 1994, $1 billion more in taxes were spent to log the national forests than the loggers paid. Footnote, Edmund Kentosky, Makers and Takers, How Wealth and Progress Are Made and How They Are Taken Away or Prevented. Minneapolis, Minnesota, American Liberty, 1997, page 305. Although logging is encouraged, hiking is discouraged. The number of backpackers increased by a factor of 10 between the 1940s and the 1980s, but trails in the national forests dropped from 144,000 miles to under 100,000. Footnote, K. 
Catherine Barton and Witt Fosberg, Audubon Wildlife Report, 1986, New York, Audubon, 1986, page 129. Should we blame the timber companies and their congressional representatives for this travesty? Hardly. After all, if we sanction aggression to prevent homesteading, we take the profit out of protecting the forest. While national forests are being depleted through special interest subsidies, trees on private property are flourishing. In the United States, 85% of new tree plantings are made on private lands. In Western Europe, private plantings increased forest cover by 30% between 1971 and 1990. Footnote, Kontoski, page 302. The largest private U.S. landowner, International Paper, carefully balances public recreation, for example backpacking, with logging. In the Southeast, 25% of its profit is from recreation. Footnote, Terry L. Anderson and Donald R. Leal, Rekindling the Privatization Fires, Political Lands Revisited. Federal Privatization Project, Issue Paper 108, Santa Monica, California, Reason, 1989, page 12. Industry grows 13% more timber than it cuts in order to prepare for future needs and increase future profits. Footnote, Kontoski, page 302. When we honor the choices of others, the desire for profit works hand-in-hand with sustainable environmental activities. Slaughtering Wildlife Governments often prevent individuals from claiming wildlife just as they prevent homesteading on land. In essence, wildlife management has become a public monopoly. Tax subsidies to manage wildlife give it the characteristics of third-layer aggression. Subsidies have often paid for the killing of wildlife, sometimes to the point of near extinction. State governments encouraged the shooting of hawks. Some, like Pennsylvania, paid hunters a tax-subsidized bounty. Aghast at this slaughter, Mrs. Rosalie Edge bought one of the hunter's favorite spots with voluntary contributions from like-minded people and turned it into a sanctuary. Hawk Mountain in the Pennsylvania Appalachians has been protecting hawks since 1934. Footnote. Special Report. The Public Benefits of Private Conservation. Environmental Quality. 15th Annual Report on the Council of Environmental Quality together with the President's Message to Congress. Washington, D.C., GPO, 1984, pages 387 to 394. In 1927, the owners of Sea Lion Caves, the only known mainland breeding and wintering area of the stellar sea lion, opened it to visitors as a naturalist attraction. Footnote, Special Report, pages 394 to 398. Meanwhile, Oregon's tax dollars went to bounty hunters who were paid to shoot sea lions. The owners of Sea Lion Caves spent much of their time chasing hunters off their property. Although the owners of Sea Lion Caves and Hawk Mountain Sanctuary were protecting the wildlife on their land, they were also forced to pay the taxes that rewarded hunters who endangered it. Not everyone in a group wants resources treated in the same way. When all people use their property as they think best, one owner's careless decision is unlikely to threaten the entire ecosystem. When bureaucrats control vast areas, however, one mistake can mean ecological disaster. In addition, special interest groups struggle for control. For example, Yellowstone National Park, the crown jewel of the national park system, has been torn apart by conflicts of interest. In 1915, the Park Service decided to eradicate the Yellowstone wolves, which were deemed to be a menace to the elk, deer, antelope, and mountain sheep that visitors like to see. Footnote Tom McNamee, Yellowstone's Missing Element, Audubon, 88.1, 1986, pages 12 to 19. Park officials induced employees to trap wolves by allowing them to keep or sell the hides. Eventually, the fox, lynx, marten, and fisher were added to the list. Footnote, Alston Chase, Playing God in Yellowstone, The Destruction of America's Finest National Park, Boston, Mariner Hewton, 1987, pages 123 to 124. Without predators, the hoofed mammals flourished and began to compete with each other for food. The larger elk eventually drove out the white-tailed deer, the mule deer, the bighorn sheep, and the pronghorn. As their numbers increased, the elk ate the willow and aspen around the riverbanks and trampled the area so that seedlings could not regenerate. Without the willow and aspen, the beaver population dwindled. Without the beavers and the ponds they created, waterfowl, mink, and otter were threatened. 
The clear water needed by the trout disappeared along with the beaver dams. Without the ponds, the water table was lowered, decreasing the vegetation growth required to sustain many other species. When park officials realized their mistake, they began removing the elk, 58,000 between 1935 and 1961. Footnote, Chase, pages 12, 28, and 29. Meanwhile, the elk overgrazed, greatly reducing the shrubs and berries that fed the bear population. In addition, the destruction of willow and aspen destroyed the grizzly habitat, while road construction and beaver loss reduced the trout population on which the grizzlies fed. When the garbage dumps were closed in the 1960s to encourage the bears to feed naturally, little was left for them to eat. They began seeking out park visitors who brought food with them. Yellowstone management began a program to remove the problem bears as well. In the early 1970s, more than 100 bears were removed. Almost twice as many grizzlies were killed. Footnote, Chase, page 155 and 173. Subsidies create tension between special interests with different views. Yellowstone visitors wanted to see deer and elk. Some naturalists would have preferred not to disturb the ecosystem, even if it meant limiting visitors and disappointing some of them. Since everyone is forced to subsidize the park, each person tries to impose his or her view as to how it should be run. The resulting compromise pleases no one. Contributors to private conservation organizations, in contrast, choose to donate to a group that shares their common purpose. For example, at Pine Butte Preserve, the Nature Conservancy replanted overgrazed areas with chokecherry shrubs for the grizzlies and fenced off sensitive areas from cattle, deer, and elk, animals that thrive in the absence of predators. Footnote, Tom Blood, Men, Elk, and Wolves, The Yellowstone Primer, Land and Resource Management in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, edited by John A. Baden and Donald Leal, San Francisco, Pacific, 1990, page 109. The Nature Conservancy has preserved more than 2.4 million acres of land since 1951. Footnote, Special Report, page 368. The Audubon Society also uses ownership to protect the environment. The Rainy Wildlife Sanctuary in Louisiana is home to marshland deer, armadillo, muskrat, otter, mink, and snow geese. Carefully managed natural gas wells and cattle herds create wealth without interfering with the native species. Footnote, Richard L. Stroop and John A. Baden, Natural Resources, Bureaucratic Myths, and Environmental Management. San Francisco, Pacific, 1983, pages 49 to 50. Other private organizations investing in wilderness areas for their voluntary membership include Ducks Unlimited, the National Wild Turkey Federation, the National Wildlife Federation, Trout Unlimited, and Wings Over Wisconsin. The story of Ravina Park, Seattle, illustrates how aggression compromises the care given to the environment. In 1887, a couple bought up the land on which some giant Douglas firs grew, added a pavilion for nature lectures, and made walking paths with benches and totems depicting Indian culture. Visitors were charged admission to support Ravina Park. Up to 10,000 people came on the busiest days. Some Seattle citizens weren't satisfied with this non-aggressive arrangement. They lobbied for the city to buy and operate the park with tax dollars, taken at gunpoint if necessary. In 1911, the city took over the park, and one by one, the giant fir trees began to disappear. Concerned citizens complained when they found that the trees were being cut into cordwood and sold. The superintendent, later charged with abuse of public funds, equipment, and personnel, told the citizens that the large Roosevelt tree had posed a threat to public safety. By 1925, all the giant fir trees were gone. Footnote, Anderson and Leal, pages 51 to 52. The superintendent could personally profit from the beautiful trees only by selling them, not by protecting them. Power corrupts. The above example succinctly illustrates the dangers of third-layer aggression. Subsidies give bureaucrats the power to trade public assets for personal gain. Unlike the personal power that comes from wisdom, inner growth, and hard work, this power comes from the point of a gun. This power of aggression corrupts those who use it, impoverishes those who have little, and destroys the earth that supports us. <laughs>